Hello, my name is Peter Forsyth. I am a research engineer in Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. This video is a re-recording of a talk that I gave recently at our machine learning and finance reading group. The talk is a discussion of a paper that I read recently at the intersection of machine learning and finance. Let's get started. So before we get into the paper itself, I think that it's useful to begin with a motivating machine learning question. That question is, how can we account for an evaluation data set from which data is missing in a non-random way, in some sort of systemic way? Now this question and the problem it describes is very generic. Um, the details of the appropriate answer will depend highly on the specific circumstances of the application. The paper that I'm about to discuss, it uses an approach called contraction, which is very useful in certain circumstances. Now, contraction was pioneered by a group of economists and computer scientists working together um, about four or five years ago. And they published a series of papers on this topic. I've cited two examples here. Now, in other circumstances, other approaches to solving this problem of non-random missing data from the evaluation data set can be appropriate. For example, there are approaches based on causal inference and approaches based on reinforcement learning. I'm not gonna discuss these approaches in detail in this talk, but I may do so in a future video. So with this motivating um, question in mind, let's proceed to discuss the paper itself. Okay, so the paper that I'm about to discuss is called FinTech for the Poor, Financial Intermediation Without Discrimination. The author is Prasanna Tantri from the Indian School of Business. Now this paper is broadly speaking an investigation of the potential application of machine learning to credit adjudication in rural India. The machine learning technique it uses is XGBoost, which is not novel. It's an off the shelf gradient boosting classifier that's quite high quality. So this machine learning technique is not really the focus of the paper, it's not the interest of the paper, and it's not where I'm gonna focus my discussion. Instead, the main interest of this paper is in its unusual setting, in the details of the application, and in the analysis that the author performs on the results. And so it's these three aspects that I'm gonna focus on in my discussion. Okay, so I said that one of the main interests of this paper um, is its setting. So let's discuss the setting. So the setting is rural Indian villages that lack bank branches. Um, so in these villages, the standard practice, according to this paper, is that Indian banks will appoint villagers to act as proxies. These proxies are called business correspondents or BCs. And it's part of the job of the BC to solicit loan applications from the other villagers. Then, periodically, a loan officer will visit the village, collect the loan applications from the BC, interview the applicant villagers, and then using both the collected applications and also information gleaned from these interviews, decide which applications to accept and which applications to reject. In other words, the loan officers adjudicate the loans. Okay, so we've discussed the setting. Now, what data is the author using in this, um, in this paper? So the data set consists of 
the loan applications received by a major Indian bank from one region of rural India. For each such application, the data set includes applicant information, that is information on who's applying for the loan. And this includes over 60 features um, with such things as assets subdivided into livestock, vehicles, and other. Um, demographic information about the applicant, including age, employment sector, education, dependents, et cetera. Cash flow information, such as expenses and income, and also the size of the requested loan. Furthermore, for each applicant, the data set includes whether the bank decided to accept or reject the loan, loan application. In other words, the adjudication decision of the loan officer. And lastly, for applications that were accepted, um, it includes information about whether the applicant defaulted. That is, whether applicants who received a loan were unable to pay back the loan. So that this is the main content of the data set. And the time range from which the data is drawn ranges from January 2017 to February 2020. The author notes that most of the applicants are farmers or owners of informal businesses. Okay, so what is sort of the main idea of the paper? Well, the main idea of the paper is as follows. So the author wants to train a model on this data set that we just described to predict for a given applicant, what is the probability that that applicant will default on their loan? So the result will be this ML model here that takes applicant characteristics and outputs a probability of default. Then the author wants to construct a credit adjudication strategy from this model. A credit adjudication strategy takes in applicant characteristics and outputs a decision to accept or reject an applicant. And usually the way this would work is that you would choose a threshold and you would accept all applicants whose probability of default is less than the threshold. Then given this credit adjudication strategy, the other's goal is to study various characteristics of, of the credit adjudication strategy. So what are the characteristics that the author wants to study? Um, well, they're, they're these ones. So these are the research questions that the author is interested in answering. So the author is interested in answering, first, could machine learning be used to improve the efficiency of credit adjudication in rural Indian villages? And second of all, could it do so without sacrificing fairness? So efficiency and fairness are the main goals of the main, author's main goals in their analysis of this credit adjudication strategy derived in a data-driven way by a machine. Okay, so we mentioned that efficiency and fairness are the author's primary goals. So it's necessary now to define in a more precise way what is meant by efficiency and fairness. Let's begin with efficiency. So, Remember that we said that a credit adjudication strategy is a rule for accepting or rejecting applicants. So therefore any credit adjudication strategy can be plotted in this 2D plane that I've drawn here, where the x-axis is the acceptance rate of the credit adjudication strategy, which is the proportion of people who apply for loans who receive loans. And the y-axis is the default rate of the credit adjudication strategy which is the proportion of people who receive loans who are unable to pay them back. So any credit adjudication strategy is a point on this plane. Now, given this, we can define efficiency. So if we have two credit adjudication strategies, S and P, we say that S is more efficient than P if the acceptance rate of S is greater than or equal to the acceptance rate of P, and the default rate of S is less than or equal to the default rate of P, and at least one of these two inequalities is strict. If you're familiar with 
efficiency in the Pareto sense, that's exactly what we're talking about here. Now, this notion of efficiency can be illustrated in this plot on the right-hand side. So this green dot corresponds to some credit adjudication strategy of interest. Uh, sorry, this blue dot corresponds to some credit adjudication strategy of interest. Then anything in this green region here is more efficient than this strategy by our definition here, because anything in this green region is better in better weakly in both ways and better strongly in at least one way. Okay, so that's our precise definition of efficiency. Now, you might ask, why are we interested in efficiency? Um, well, two main reasons. The first reason is if we adopt the point of view of the Indian bank that's making these loans, then the bank is going to be interested in its profit. And loosely speaking, we can say that there's a strong, there's a connection between efficiency and profit. Um, and this makes sense in general. So holding all other factors equal, a more efficient strategy will be more profitable. Um, you can see that by thinking about, say that we have um, some credit adjudication strategy and say that we can decrease the default rate without changing anything else, without increasing the acceptance rate and with all other relevant factors, such as the sizes of the loans remaining constant. Then by decreasing the default rate, the bank loses less money, so it makes more profit. Um, so it's fairly intuitive that efficiency corresponds to profit. Um, and if you're interested in more details on this topic, you can see these two references here, which have a precise formula for the valuation of a portfolio of short-term loans using the principles of no arbitrage. And using this formula, you can work out the details of how a bank's um, profits from its lending depend on um, defaults and acceptance. Okay, so that's, anyway, this is our first motivation for being interested in efficiency is that it corresponds to profit. Our second reason for being interested in efficiency is an economic development reason. So remember that in an earlier slide, we said that um, most of the applicants are farmers or informal business owners. So it follows that um, this money that's borrowed can be used to per used for investment purposes. It can be used to purchase equipment, capital goods, land, fertilizer, et cetera, which will um, make the business, make the small businesses that the um, applicants run sort of more profitable, um, more successful in the future. Um, an alternative use of the credit, of this credit would be um, welfare. That is, if um, consumption, or sorry, if um, consumption would, would naturally follow some sort of irregular pattern as a result of fluctuations in income, then a loan can be used to smooth consumption for example, if there's a drought causing a reduction in farming income, a loan can be used to avoid the farmer having to drastically cut down on consumption. And so therefore the loan can improve the welfare of the farm. Now, both of these credit uses would be classified as, as being sort of beneficial from an economic development point of view. I mean, it's, it's generally the consensus of development economists that an expansion of credit, i.e. an increase in credit efficiency, corresponds to or spurs um, increased development. Um, you can see this paper from the World Bank here for more details. And so if we were interested in economic development, this, this is another reason to be interested in the efficiency of these loans. Okay, so those are two motivations for being interested in efficiency. But efficiency isn't our only goal. Remember that we also are interested in fairness. So we precisely defined efficiency. Now let's precisely define fairness. So this paper, the, the notion of fairness that it uses is a notion of relative fairness. And it says that a strategy is fair if it does not have a disparate impact on a protected group as compared to a reference group. So in this definition, obviously it's necessary to define a protected group and a reference group. The protected group will typically be a minority and the reference group, the majority. So the motivation of this relative fairness definition 
is that we want to avoid penalizing those who are already at a disadvantage. Um, so in this case, the, the author of this paper um, looks at uh, a few different protected groups, but the main one is scheduled castes and scheduled tribes, i.e. SCST people, um, which are a group that's defined in the Indian constitution and who has historically suffered from severe economic and sort of societal disadvantage. Um, and the reference group that the author uses is sort of the general remaining population. So then our, our definition of fairness, um, it results from a comparison of the credit adjudications behavior for the protected group versus the reference group. Okay, and then we said that a, a strategy is fair if it doesn't have a disparate impact on the protected group. Now it's necessary to define precisely what a disparate impact is. So it's, it's this quantity here. So we say that the disparity of a strategy S on a protected group P relative to a reference group R when we're using impact function I is this. So it's the impact of the strategy on the protected group divided by the impact of the strategy on the reference group. And the goal is to obtain this D quotient being close to one because this would correspond to low disparity and therefore by our definition, high fairness. Now, of course, this definition of disparity, it's highly dependent on the choice of impact function. And there are many impact functions that you could choose depending on your specific interest, but there are two broad categories, accuracy impact functions and outcome impact functions. Now, accuracy impact functions are about measuring the quality of the machine learning model's predictions. So for example, we could say in this case that we're interested in the accuracy of our model's prediction of default. And then we would say that, um, well, our, our model is unfair if it's worse at predicting um, who's going to default among STSC people versus the general Indian population. Um, in contrast to accuracy, we could be interested in outcome. So an example of this would be, we would say that our, our credit adjudication strategy is unfair if the proportion of STSC people rejected for loans is significantly higher than the proportion of the general population rejected for loans. Um, so you'll note that these are actually two quite different kinds of impact functions, and they may make they may be even in in sort of conflict with one another. Okay, and I'll end this slide just by noting that in fact the correct definition of fairness in machine learning is quite controversial. Um, there's been a number of papers, for example, this one, noting that if you optimize for a given definition of fairness, which on its surface appears to be sensible, it's possible that paradoxically, um, you'll get sort of unfair results. Um, so consequently, this is quite a subtle issue, and there's a lot of debate about precisely what the right definition of fairness is. Um, but this is the definition of fairness that's, that's used in this paper we're discussing. And so this is the one I'm going to focus on for the purposes of, of my discussion. OK, so let's have sort of an interim summary here. So the interim summary is that, um, well, what is, what's the goal of, of this paper? The goal of this paper is to train a machine learning model to predict the probability that a loan applicant will default from that loan applicant's application features. And then we're gonna convert this into adjudication strategy that says we should offer loans to the applicants with the lowest predicted probability of default according to a model. Remembering that, of course, as we said before, the model predicts probability of default, the adjudication strategy defi defines who's accepted and who's rejected. Okay, and then once we have this credit adjudication strategy, the last step is to evaluate it for efficiency and fairness on the test step. Okay, so this is this is sort of the initial approach, but unfortunately, this initial approach it has a fatal flaw. And here is here is the fatal flaw. So I've illustrated in a cartoon here. Um, a diagram of sort of the lineage of the data set on which we're doing our evaluation. So in this cartoon, um, note that there's, there's eight applicants initially, 
and um, only some of them are accepted. So in this cartoon, applicants one to six are accepted for a loan by the loan officer. Now, these applicants one to six, since they're the ones that are accepted, they're the ones whose default behavior we observe. We, so we observe in this cartoon that applicant two defaults and applicant five defaults. And so our data set for evaluation purposes is applicant one to applicant six. It doesn't include applicant seven and applicant eight because those applicants are not given loans by the loan officer. And so we don't observe whether they default or not. And so this is a fundamental problem because it means that the data set on which we're doing our evaluation is not sort of a random sample of the, the applicants. Instead, it's a biased sample where the biased bias um, results from the pre-existing rules for acceptance used by the loan officer. This is our problem. Okay, so to recapitulate, the problem is that the data set only includes default information for applicants accepted by the loan officer. So what this means is that when we're evaluating our credit adjudication strategy, what we're really doing is not evaluating a pure machine learning credit adjudication strategy. Instead, what we're actually doing is evaluating a credit adjudication strategy that uses a two-stage filter. The first stage is the loan officer. And then only once the loan officer has done the initial filtration, the second stage is the machine learning model. So first filtering with the loan officer and then filtering with the machine learning model. And so this causes a problem which can be illustrated using the same 2D plane of acceptance rate and default rate we used before. So say that this blue dot corresponds to the acceptance rate and default rate achieved by the loan officer. Then, well, this yellow region here, this, this region includes all the possible um, machine learning strategies we can possibly evaluate. Because remember, we said we can only evaluate two stage strategies. So necessarily, since the first stage is a loan officer, all our two stage strategies must have lower acceptance rate than the loan officer. So they need to lie in this region here. But remember that our goal is to achieve strategies that are more efficient than the loan officer. I, we want strategies that lie in the green region here. And now you can see the problem. The problem is that this green region does not intersect this yellow region. I, the strategies we can evaluate don't intersect the strategies we want to achieve. So we can't really achieve, we can't really evaluate a strategy that's more efficient than the loan officer strategy. And this is a fundamental problem. Okay, and this problem known as a selective labels problem is not sort of a newly recognized problem. It's been understood to be a problem in the analysis of credit for a very long time. Um, for example, here, I've, I've included a quote from a paper by Chapman written in 1940, 82 years ago. And um, this quote says, um, if it were the bank's policy to increase volume through the extension of loan services to new classes of borrowers, a study based on actual current borrowers would give but little indication of the characteristics of the better risks. In other words, um, Chapman, who was doing sort of a very early study of what characteristics of borrowers made them inclined to default was also recognizing the limitations of his study by saying that we know nothing about people who haven't been offered any credit. We have no data on them. Um, in other words, we know nothing about these applicants seven and eight. Um, and there's another story that I heard secondhand, which may be apocryphal, but I found it illustrative. And that story was that a certain British banker um, was so frustrated by the effect that the selective labels problem had on his data that he decided he would randomly accept or reject applicants for loans for a given period of time to increase the quality of his data. So in conclusion in this slide, the conclusion of this slide is that, well, the selective labels problem, it's a big problem, it's significant, and it's been known for a very long time. Okay, so are we stuck? Is this the end of the paper? Um, Fortunately, that it's, we're not stuck. Um, so the author uses a rather clever approach based on contraction and, an ob and, a, and a sort of insightful observation. 
And the approach is as follows. So it's based on the following observation. It's based on the observation from sort of the behavioral economics psychology literature that says that, well, when quotas are imposed on sort of salespeople or administrators, a quota being a dictate that you need to produce a certain amount of output over a given period of time, then the salespeople or administrators don't um, produce a constant output over the, the period over which the quota covers. Instead, they significantly increase their output towards the end of the period as, as the termination of the quota period approaches. Um, and the author, looking at um, the data set in question, the data set um, being used here, notes that this, this in fact holds for this data set. So the loan officers have a quota of loans that they need to make over, over a month. And um, the author notes that the acceptance rate in the second half of the month, which the author calls the lenient period, is significantly higher than the acceptance rate in the first half of the month, which the author calls the strict period. So here we've got 0.44 versus 0.82. So very significant increase in acceptance rate of loan applications as we approach the end of the month. Okay, and this discrepancy in the acceptance rate between the two halves of the month enables the author to apply this contraction approach. And here's, here's the idea. So we, get, we again have default rate on the y-axis, acceptance rate on the x-axis. And in this, this diagram, we have the acceptance rate and default rate achieved by the loan officer in the lenient period, i.e. the second half of the month plotted here, and the rates achieved by the loan officer in the strict period plotted here. So then what the approach taken is that, okay, so we take the, the loan applicants accepted by the loan officer in the lenient period. Then we rank the applicants by riskiness using our trained machine learning model. Finally, we, in a stepwise manner, reject um, applicants where reject applicants one by one, where we're always rejecting the most riskiest, the riskiest remaining applicant according to the machine learning model. And in so doing, we're gonna gradually reduce the acceptance rate. And we keep going until the acceptance rate of this filtered lenient period portfolio matches the acceptance rate achieved by the loan officer in the strict period. And then once we've done this, we can ask, does the filtered lenient period portfolio have a lower default rate than the strict period portfolio achieved by the loan officer. So we compare positions on the y-axis, i.e. default rate. And if so, then we can make the following argument. We can argue that, well, the machine learning model is better at filtering from a high acceptance rate to a low acceptance rate than the loan officer is because um, we start at the same point, but we achieve a lower default rate. Um, so that's sort of the, the approach that the author wants to take. So we can see this as a partial mitigation of the selective labels problem that we mentioned earlier. This isn't a complete mitigation, but it, it allows us to say something, whereas before we could say nothing. Um, so this is clearly a, a very significant improvement in the conclusions that we can draw from our data. Um, and and a key requirement of this approach is that the population of applicants in the lenient period is comparable to the population of applicants in the strict period. Because of course, this approach is about comparing the filtered lenient period portfolio with the strict period portfolio. Um, and the author performs some statistical tests that support this conclusion that these populations don't differ significantly. And we can understand how this contraction approach works um, by plotting some, some more in this sort of default rate acceptance rate plane. So remember that before the issue was that there was no, there was no intersection between the efficient green region and the feasible yellow region. But now we can understand that by using contraction, we've resolved this problem. Now the efficient green region is defined by the strict period whereas the feasible yellow region is defined by the lenient period. And so these two regions intersect. So now it's possible to achieve um, an efficient strategy that we can evaluate. So that's, that's how we can sort of graphically understand this contraction procedure that the author makes use. 
Okay, so now let's have another interim summary to say, okay, what is our revised approach? The revised approach is as follows. We train our XGBoost model to predict default on the accepted applicants in the training data set. Then we move to the test data set and we evaluate the efficiency of the resulting credit adjudication strategy using contraction. Then we evaluate the fairness of, of this credit adjudication strategy. Okay, so that, that's the approach. Now let's, let's discuss the results. So here, as before in my cartoons, we have the acceptance rate on the x-axis and the default rate on the y-axis. Um, and these are, these are the actual results that the author achieves. Um, and so in this diagram, the point x1 corresponds to the lenient period, the acceptance rate and default rate of the lenient period. The point x2 corresponds to the strict period. This line here corresponds to what happens if you start with the lenient period portfolio, use the machine learning algorithm to rank applicants by riskiness, and progressively reject the riskiest applicants. Then you move along this line. And we can see from point x3 that at the same acceptance rate as the strict period loan officer, the machine learning algorithm achieves a lower default rate. And furthermore, by this point x4, we can see that at the same default rate as the strict period loan officer, the machine learning algorithm achieves a higher acceptance rate. So this argues that machine learning can, in fact, be used to improve the efficiency of loan adjudication. Now, we mentioned that one of the main goals of the bank is profit. So given that, um, it's useful to think about um, what are the implications for this approach on, on profit. So we can, we can plot in this diagram on the x-axis the loan amount and on the y-axis, profit. And um, note that this computation, computing profit here, well, it requires um, a few things. It requires the sizes of the loans, which are mentioned in the data set, and so the author uses those, but it also requires loss given default. That is the amount of money that is, that is lost or sort of equivalently the amount of money that was recovered when a borrower defaults. And that information is not present in the data set, See, the author is forced to make some sort of reasonable assumptions to draw this plot. Okay, so in this plot, as before, X1 is the lenient period loan officer, X2 is the strict period loan officer, and the line corresponds to machine learning-based filtration. And from point X3, we can see that when the loan amount um, measured in money is the same for the strict period loan officer and the machine learning filtered model, the machine learning filtered model achieves a higher profit. Okay, but fairness, sorry, efficiency is not the only thing we're interested in. We're also interested in fairness. And we mentioned that um, we want to evaluate fairness by this sort of relative fairness disparity-based measure. Um, so here, this, this slide, um, I've summarized the results. There's actually a few more, actually, a few more sort of fairness analyses that I'm not gonna talk about, but you can read the paper to see them. Um, okay, so to evaluate fairness, we need to pick an adjudication strategy because every point on this line corresponds to a different adjudication strategy. See, the author picks the adjudication strategy with an acceptance rate of 40% and then evaluates its fairness. And the author used this, uses this aquatoss fairness toolbox to study the fairness of the adjudication strategy. The results are in this table here. Um, actually, the author explores a few more impact functions, but I've, I've included these three here because I think they give you the main idea. Um, so in the first column, I list the impact function, then the value of the impact on the reference population, on the protected population, and the corresponding disparity. So the first impact function is false disparity rate, sorry, false discovery rate. And this is the proportion of people predicted to default who do not actually default. Um, and um, so we see that this, this results in a disparity of 
The next impact function is the false positive rate, which is the proportion who, def who do not default, but who are falsely predicted to, to default. And this is 1.18. And the last is the predicted positive rate, which is just the proportion rejected for the loans. And here we get a disparity of 1.03. So these first two impact functions, these are accuracy impact functions. And we can conclude that there's some slight, there's some sort of slight but non-negligible disparity when we look at these accuracy impact functions. In other words, we can conclude that the model is slightly worse at predicting default behavior for STSC people as compared to the reference population. The last impact function here, this is an outcome impact function, and the disparity is very small here. So in, we can conclude that, there, that the disparity in terms of proportion of people actually rejected for loans is pretty negligible. So I guess the overall conclusion here is that there is some accuracy disparity, but negligible, um, negligible outcome disparity. Um, furthermore, this, this model, according to the Aquitas toolbox, is certified fair which is just a statement that these disparities here, they don't breach whatever thresholds has been, have been set for the Aquitas tool, toolbox. So, so they fall within acceptable ranges for, for qualification as fairness, as fair. Okay, so those are the fairness results. The author also performs another, a number of robustness tests. So a natural question you might ask is, well, we found that the machine learning model is more efficient than the loan officer, but is this finding statistically significant? Another way of saying that is to ask, what's the probability that this finding could have arisen by chance? To address this question, the author adopts a bootstrapping approach. Um, the author starts with the lenient period loan portfolio and then randomly rejects applicants until the acceptance rate matches that of the strict period loan officer. And this procedure is repeated many times. And then this, this, this procedure will result in a distribution of default rates. So then by comparing this distribution of default rates that result from random rejection to the actual default rate achieved by the machine learning model, we can, approach, we can have an answer to the question, how likely is it that this result was, could be achieved by chance? And here's the result of this robustness test. So on the x-axis is percentage change in default rate versus the strict period loan, op loan officer. The histogram shows this the distribution resulting from random rejection. The dotted line corresponds to the 95th percentile of this distribution. And the red line corresponds to the points achieved by the machine learning based rejection of applicants. And we can see that it's well outside the 95th percentile, indicating that indeed this finding is highly statistically significant. Okay, another question that you might have is, um, well, this contraction strategy relies crucially on the comparability between the populations in the strict and lenient period. And we addressed this question earlier, saying that statistical tests said that they were comparable. In other words, and this supported the whole contraction approach, which relies crucially on comparing the lenient and strict period. Um, but there's another way that these, these two periods could be non-comparable. And that would be that even if the characteristics of the applicants were the same between the two periods, it could be that the relationship between these characteristics and probability of default changes between the two periods. In other words, we could have concept drift. Um, so it's a test for concept drift, um, which because if concept drift was present, this would undermine the contraction argument. So the author tests for concept drift by training a model on the strict period, evaluating it on the lean period and vice versa. And if there was concept drift, we would accept, expect large degradation in model performance af after you transfer across periods. But the author doesn't observe this, suggesting that there isn't significant concept drift and further supporting the validity of the contraction argument. OK, and the author actually performs a number of more robustness tests, which you can read in the paper. But I thought those, those two were the most interesting. Okay, so let's have some concluding discussion. So this paper, it was an interesting application of machine learning for credit to a very understudied population. And it offers an interesting and sort of not that well-known solution to the selective labels problem in its use of this, this sort of contraction approach. 
Also, I appreciated the extensive robustness tests that were present in this paper. Um, however, the paper doesn't include a code. And I think that nearly any machine learning based paper can be improved by the release of code because it makes more precise any sort of technical definitions that are used in the paper. Um, and so I would have appreciated that here. I think it would have made, made some of the discussion a lot clearer. Okay, and what are some extensions of this paper I could think of? Well, um, first of all, can we, can we look at fairness um, in more detail? Um, so for example, could we train the model with fairness as part of the objective? And if we did so, what would be the cost in terms of efficiency? Um, we, th I think this would be an interesting way to look at the trade-off between the two, or even if there is any trade-off at all between efficiency and fairness. Um, I'd like to also see a more thorough investigation of the reasons for the, the discrepancy and the details of the discrepancy between acceptance rate and the strict and lenient period. Because after all, the whole argument that underlies this contraction approach, it relies on this discrepancy of acceptance rates between the strict and lenient period. So I think a more detailed discussion of this, both more details about, about this discrepancy in the data set, like how does it vary, say, over, over from month to month, et cetera, and also the institutional setup in the bank that gives rise to this discrepancy. I think that would do more to support this crucial part of the argument. I'm also, I'd be interested to know, like, is there any anything that we could recognize that the machine learning model is picking up um, that the loan officer is missing? Any particular characteristics or combination of characteristics that the machine learning model is learning to use that are highly predictive of default? I mean, this is basically asking for explainability, which in some circumstances is hard, but I think it's, it's important to investigate. Um, some more far out there ideas, well, the first one is um, you can sort of think that this problem of credit adjudication, it's it's a classic explore exploit trade off. That is, well, if you offer credit to people that haven't previously been offered credit, this offers good, this provides you with good data, which you can use to develop your future um, credit adjudication strategies more accurately. Um, so the more sort of exploration you do, the more you can get around this selective labels problem. But once you've done enough exploration, then you want to exploit the, the model, the knowledge that you've gained by your exploration and offer credit to the people based on your current data least likely to default. So it seems naturally that you can think of this as an explore exploit trade-off. So then obvi the obvious question is, can we formulate this credit adjudication problem as some sort of reinforcement learning problem? I think that would be very interesting. Um, and lastly, I'll mention just causal inference, which is another approach that's used um, to sort of get around um, biased or censored data sets. So it'd be useful to think about the relationship of causal inference to the work done here. Okay, um, so that's that's the end of my of my discussion. Um, I, thanks for thanks for listening to my talk. Um, I hope that you found it um, very useful and informative.